Hi everyone, welcome to your virtual lecture on the appendicular skeleton. This virtual lecture will be available for multiple hours today, so I would encourage you to pause or go back as you follow through with your PowerPoint slides. During our normal class, I would allot time for breaks and for you to label and complete your fill-ins, but during this virtual lecture, I'm going straight through, so you can do this at your own speed. I also wanted to bring a few reminders to your attention. We have a health condition paper that we'll need to complete for this course, and the details are in the syllabus. We also have our second assignment due on Wednesday, October 2nd at 2 p.m. sharp, and we'll complete this via Blackboard electronically. Before we begin, let's review an, a few important key concepts to the skeletal system. First, the definition of health, the ability to function at 100% mentally, physically, and socially. So health is about function, and the importance of the spine is that it houses the spinal column, which is the brain's way to send messages to every single organ, tissue, muscle, cell in the body. We have 206 bones in the body, 60 of which are part of the axial skeleton. The axial skeleton is comprised of structures along our midline, such as our skull, our facial bones, our vertebral column, and our rib cage. The axial, axial skeleton is comprised of our upper and lower limbs, as well as the shoulder and pelvic girdles. Let's begin with the shoulder girdle. We have two shoulder girdles, left and right sides. They are also known as the pectoral girdle. Their function is to attach the upper limbs to the axial skeleton. The shoulder girdle consists of two structures, the clavicle and the scapula. The diagram on your left is an anterior view of the shoulder girdle. Let me walk you through a few structures here. First, we have the sternum, which will connect to the clavicle via the sternoclavicular joint. The clavicle will then move laterally and attach to the scapula, which is this entire structure right here, via the acromioclavicular joint. The scapula will attach to the humerus via the glenohumeral joint. When we look at the posterior view of the shoulder girdle, we can see a very nice view of the entire scapula right here, and we can also see part of the clavicle sticking out from the anterior aspect. So the clavicle is the anterior aspect of the shoulder girdle and it will articulate with the manubrium to form the sternoclavicular joint. And the scapula is the posterior aspect of the shoulder girdle. The scapula articulates in two places. It articulates with the clavicle to form the acromioclavicular joint, and it articulates with the humor. Going into more depth about the clavicle, The clavicle is a slender bone. It has an S shape. It is subcutaneous. That means it's right below the skin. Therefore, it's easily palpable. The clavicle lies horizontally across the anterior thorax. And in males, it will be rougher and more curved. The medial end of the clavicle, closer to the midline, is known as the sternal end because this is where it will articulate with the sternum. The lateral end of the clavicle, closer to its connection with the scapula, is called the acromial end. We have two structures on the clavicle, the first being the conoid tubercle. This is an attachment site for the conoid ligament. Be careful with the spelling on this because when we learned about the mandible, we learned the coracoid process and now in the clavicle, we have conoid tubercle. 
We also have a costal tuberosity. Remember the word costal means ribs. This is also known as the impression for the costoclavicular ligament. And that ligament attaches the first rib. On your first diagram on the top, we're looking at the right clavicle from a superior view. So we're looking S to I, we're looking down on top of the clavicle. You can see the sternal end is the more medial end. This end definitely looks a lot different than the lateral end. This has a hard line to it where it's going to connect with the sternum. And when we look at the lateral, more acromial end, you can see this nice, larger, rounded projection. Closer to the acromial end, the lateral end, we also see the conoid tubercle. In the bottom diagram, we're looking at the right clavicle again, but this time we're looking at it from inferior to superior. So we're looking at the bottom aspect. Again, let me point out the sternal end, which is where it will connect to the manubrium. The acromial end, which is the larger, more rounded projection that's on the lateral aspect. We can also see the conoid tubercle from this end as well, which is closest to the acromial end. And, and on this view, we also see the costal tuberosity. On the rib models, this is going to look like a roughened patch for that ligament to connect the clavicle to first rib. The second piece of the shoulder girdle the scapula is called scapulae with an E at the end when plural. This is a large triangular flat bone and it lies on our posterior thorax specifically between ribs 2 to 7. The scapula has four borders and two angles. Let's take a look at this diagram of the scapula. We're looking at a right scapula and we're looking at the posterior view. So we'll start with the borders. This edge right here is the medial border of the scapula. This is the edge that's closest to the spine. Then if we follow that around counterclockwise, we come to the inferior angle. Following that up, we'll have the lateral border of the scapula. And of course, the superior border. Our second angle is called the superior angle, which is located right here. It's the small ridge. It looks like a bump on top of the medial end of the scapula. So four borders, medial, lateral, superior, inferior, and two angles, superior and inferior. Then we have a number of other structures to identify in a scapula. From the posterior view, this large area right on top of the triangle shape is called the infraspinatus fossa. Remember fossa means shallow depression and it's called the infraspinatus fossa because of the muscles that you'll learn about in our next unit. So when we label things infraspinatus, supraspinatus, and so forth, those are the name of shoulder muscles. Speaking of supraspinatus fossa, that's right here, right above the infraspinatus fossa. These two fossas, or shallow depressions, are divided by a structure called the scapular spine. At the end of the scapular spine, at the lateral aspect, we have a structure called the acromion. Now, when we were talking about the clavicle, we described its lateral end that connected to the scapula in this location as the acromial end, and this is why, because we were referencing this lateral structure of the scapula called the acromion. Then, more ear interior to the acromion, we have another projection here called the coracoid process. Again, be careful on your spelling here because we've learned a lot of words that sound similar to this. So we just had conoid tubercle on the clavicle 
And now on the posterior aspect of the shoulder girdle, we now have coracoid process. And finally, we have the glenoid cavity. This is best seen on a lateral view, which we'll look at in a moment, but this is where the humerus will fit into that scapula to help create our shoulder joint. The diagram on the left is again the right scapula, but we're looking at it from a lateral to medial view. So we're looking at the arm in towards the spine. The first thing we see right away is this large glenoid cavity. Here on the posterior aspect, this is that scapular spine that was coming up in between the two fossas ending in the acromion process which will attach to the clavicle. Then more anteriorly we can see the coracoid process. On both of these views, the lateral on the left and the anterior view of a right scapula on the right side, we can also see the inferior angle. So on our right diagram, we're looking at the scapula front to back. Just like the posterior side, we have a large fossa right in the center of the triangle shape. And this is called the subscapular fossa, sub meaning below the scapula. Again, we can see that superior angle. We can also see a part of the scapular spine coming up right here to end in this lateral structure called the acromion. Coracoid process is located right here, but is not as visible in this view as the others. Again, we can see the glenoid cavity. And we have a new structure on the anterior view of the right scapula, and that's the small divot right here called the scapular notch. Completing the shoulder girdle and moving on to the upper limb. Each upper limb has 30 bones and these 30 bones are split into three different locations. We have the arm, which if you recall from our first unit, that only describes the area between the shoulder and the elbow. Then we have the forearm, which only describes the area between the elbow and wrist. And finally, the hand. So in each upper limb, we have 30 bones, which means 60 bones total when you take into account left and right sides. Of these 30 bones, we have one humerus, which is the large long bone of the arm. We have a radius and an ulna on each side, which make up the bones of the forearm. And in the hand, we will have eight carpals, which are the small wrist bones, five metacarpals, and 14 phalanges per hand. Let's start at the top and work our way inferior. The humerus is the largest and longest bone of the upper limb. It articulates proximally with the scapula, and it articulates distally with the forearm bones, the radius and ulna. Your diagram that is more left, let's label letters A, B, C, and D. A is the head of the humerus. B is the anatomical neck. C is the surgical neck. And D is the greater tubercle. So you'll notice that the humerus on its proximal end has two necks, anatomical and surgical. There's a reason for that. The anatomical neck of the humerus used to be a specific structure. That's why it's the official neck of the humerus, if you will. But based on statistics for 
injuries to this bone, it also has a surgical neck. So what did that anatomical neck used to be? It was the epiphyseal plate in the growth process. Looking at the diagram on the right, this is a view of the humerus, the proximal end, the distal end, and the body is the part of the long bone in the center. Taking a closer look at both proximal and distal ends, the top diagram is the proximal end. It's the right humerus, and we're looking at it from an anterior to posterior view. So first, we can see the edge of the head of the humerus, as well as that anatomical neck. This will look like a deep groove between the head and the greater tubercle, which is located right here. Because we have a greater tubercle, that must mean that we have a lesser tubercle as well. And yes, it is smaller. The lesser tubercle is located right here. In between lesser and greater tubercle, we have the intertubercular sulcus, or groove. Then, below the entire proximal end, but not yet into the body of the humerus, we have the surgical neck. The lower diagram is the distal end of the humerus. Again, this is still the right side, and it's an anterior view. Note which side is the lateral. Your left is the lateral aspect of this distal humerus. As we come down the body towards the distal end, we have a lateral supracondylar ridge. And that just describes this entire ridge right here between the body and the neck structure, which is the lateral epicondyle, this rounded lateral edge right here. We have a similar structure on the medial aspect called the medial epicondyle. The medial epicondyle looks much larger than the lateral, so that's one little trick that you can use to always identify what you're looking at on a bone. This structure right in the center is made up of two different things. On the medial side, we have the trochlea, and on the lateral aspect, we have the capitulum. The capitulum and trochleum, trochlea together kind of remind me of a bow tie structure. Above the half that is the trochlea on the medial side of the distal humerus, we have a large, uh, a large socket here, and this is called the coronoid fossa. Again, you've got to watch the spelling on those C words, coronoid fossa. On the lateral aspect, above the capitulum, we have another deep groove here, and this is called the radial fossa. You'll remember that it's the radial fossa because you know that the radius bone in the forearm is on the lateral side, so that will help you remember. So putting that all together, Let's take a look at the whole humerus, the right humerus, but this time let's check the posterior view. We can see various structures at the proximal end. We can see the head of the humerus much better. There's our anatomical neck that used to be the epiphyseal growth plate, part of our greater tubercle, and the surgical neck. The surgical neck is right below that proximal end, but it's not quite the body of the humerus yet. The body of the humerus is this area from here all the way down to here, and it's also called the shaft of a long bone. On this body, we have two structures. First is the deltoid tuberosity. This is closer to the proximal end. And then we have a radial groove. This will be a small, subtle groove on the body closer to the distal end of the posterior side of the humerus. Then, just like on the anterior side, 
as we come down from the body towards the distal end, we have the lateral and medial supracondylar ridge. Then our lateral structures are lateral and medial epicondyle. You can see the back of the trochlea here, but this looks distinctly different. On the anterior side of the distal end, we saw those two structures that looked just like a bow tie. Now, on the distal end of the posterior view, we have a large fossa. This is called the olecranon fossa. So when you pick up a bone during lab, the first thing you want to do is identify which bone it is. And the second thing you want to do is identify in which direction are you looking at it. So the easiest way is on a humerus to identify the correct direction is first check which side is proximal and which side is distal. The proximal side is the larger rounded top. Then once you have it the correct S to I direction, you're going to look for the anterior and posterior sides. You'll check the distal end to see if it has this very large fossa. If so, you're on the posterior view. If you see the bow tie, you're on the anterior view. When we take a look at the lateral view of the humerus, we can see that deltoid tuberosity just a little bit better here. Now the deltoid is a muscle that we'll learn about in our next unit, but it's a very large muscle that covers the shoulder joint kind of like a cap or a suction. So the deltoid is actually going to insert on this area of the body of the humerus. Our forearm represents the area between elbow to hand, and the forearm is made of two structures, the radius and the ulna. In your diagram on the left, you can see that the radius and ulna do look somewhat similar. They're both slender, long bones. So how do you know which is which, especially when those two bones are not shown together? I have two hints for you. First, Look at the end and look for the structure that looks like a radial tire. You'll know it's the head of the radius. You can also look at the ends of these two long bones and look for the U-shaped ulna. So if you see this shape right here that appears to be a giant U, the U stands for ulna. Another way that you can always remember the radius is give yourself a thumbs up and say in a cheesy 1980s voice, it's rad. And when you do that, you will remember that the radius is always on the thumb side of our forearm. So your picture in your upper left is a view of the radius because we see that radial tire right there. We're looking at the proximal end, so this is the end closest to the elbow, and we're looking at the anterior view. We've got three important structures here. First, the head, the head of the radius. This is that piece that looks like a tire. Then we have the neck. In this bone, it's just one neck, no anatomical or surgical. Then we have the radial tuberosity. We have two more structures on your bottom right picture. These are on the distal end of the radius, so the end closer to the wrist, and this is in the posterior view. On this distal end, we have two structures, the styloid process and the ulnar notch. The ulnar notch is going to be the more medial of the structures, and you'll remember that because the, it will connect to the ulna right next door to it. We looked at the radius and ulna next door to each other. Here's what's interesting, is that the head of the radius is located up here, proximally closer to the elbow. But the head of the ulna is all the way down here. So the head of the ulna is more distal, closer to the wrist joint, and it's also medial while the radius is lateral. Then. 
in our diagram of the radius, we also learned about a structure called the styloid process, which is located right here. Well, what a coincidence. The other aspect of this bone is called styloid process as well. So both the radius and the ulna have styloid process and they're, both structures are towards the outside of the forearms. The one is a word that represents elbow. So let's look at the radius, ulna, and humerus together to form the elbow joint. First diagram in the upper left, here's that bow tie shaped structure in white. Remember we had the medial trochlea and the lateral capitulum. The trochlear notch, that U-shaped structure of the ulna, will fit perfectly behind here. And there's the head of our radius. On an x-ray, here's what that exact same joint looks like. You can especially see in this x-ray how distinct this medial epicondyle of the humerus is. It's a much larger projection. Then in the upper right diagram, we're looking at a lateral view of the elbow, which shows us very nicely this U-shaped trochlear notch of the ulna articulating with the bow tie structure, the capitulum and the trochlea. There's the head of the radius. In your lower blue picture, we're looking at a right elbow, both from the anterior and posterior aspects. So the actual elbow joint is formed by two articulations. It's formed by the trochlear notch of the ulna with the trochlea of the humerus. So that's this structure right here. This is the as posterior aspect of it. Here it is again, the trochlear notch of the ulna connecting with the trochlea of the humerus. Here's our trochlea of our humerus again. The second articulation that forms the elbow joint is the head of the radius, located right here, with the capitulum of the humerus. So those are the two specific articulations that form the elbow joint. Continuing to the skeleton of the hand, we have eight carpal bones. Carpal bones are our small wrist bones, and they are joined together by ligaments and articulations that are known as intercarpal joints. In the carpals, we have two horizontal rows of four bones each. Remember my favorite phrase, structure reflects function. So the names of these eight carpal bones will often tell you something about their shape. Let's take a look at those bones. This is an x-ray of a hand. Here's our thumb right here. This is the lateral aspect. And there's our pinky finger. Here's the radius, the proximal end of the radius, and the proximal end of the ulna. So these bones right here are our eight carpals. Two rows, one, two, with four bones each. They are here, 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 here. This one's hard to see on an x-ray, but there's a small P-shaped bone here, here, and here. The scaphoid, the lunate, the triquetrum, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and a hamate. I know what you're thinking right now. You're wondering, how am I going to remember all of that? Don't worry, we have a mnemonic. So let's take a look at the model. Again, in the upper left corner, here's that thumb. So this is our lateral aspect. Here's our pinky finger. 
So then we have the proximal ends of the ulna on the medial side and the radius on the lateral side. Here the bones are a little bit easier for you to see. We have two rows, one, two, with four bones apiece. So first we have the scaphoid right here with the S. The word scaphoid literally means boat-like. And I'm not sure if this reminds me of a boat, but it could be an upside down sailboat. Then working clockwise from the bottom row, we have the lunate. The word lunate represents moon. Then we have the triquetrum, which means triangle shaped. And the pisiform. Pisiform is a P-shaped small bone on the medial aspect of our palm. Then on the second row, still working clockwise, we have the hamate. The word hamate means hooked. Then the capitate. The word cap refers to head shaped. Then we have T for trapezoid. And underneath the thumb, we have the trapezium. A trapezium has no parallel sides. And another hint to remember which is which between all of these T bones is say this phrase just like this. The trapezium is under the thumb. So if you say it like that and you accentuate the words trapezium and thumb, they almost sound like they could be similar. So you'll remember that trapezium is right under the thumb. So I have a mnemonic for you to remember these eight carpal bones. And the mnemonic is going to work clockwise. And in the lower right picture, you can see that I've diagrammed the bone that I want you to start with, which is the scaphoid. I want you to work lateral to medial across the first row. Then you're going to come back, go to the second row underneath the thumb, again on the lateral side, work lateral to medial. The mnemonic is, so long to the pinky, here comes the thumb. Beginning at the scaphoid, we have so long to pinky, here comes the thumb. Oh, you know what? On this lower right diagram, that should actually be the opposite. You'll start at the medial aspect and work your way lateral. So long to pinky, here comes the thumb. Moving more distal. From the carpal bones, we have the metacarpals and phalanges. Each phalange actually has three subcomponents. So in this uh, skeleton of the hand, we have our eight carpal bones right here. Then we have the metacarpals, which are these structures that come immediately distal to the carpal bones. And these are actually found within the palm of your hand. Then. The last three structures are phalanges, only two structures on the thumb. And the way that these phalanges are named are they're named proximal, middle, and distal. So if you look in your lower right corner, you look at this picture of the finger, you have your proximal, middle, and distal phalanges. Each phalange is separated by a joint. So the distal phalanx is separated from the middle phalanx by the distal interphalangeal joint, abbreviated DIP, D-I-P, distal interphalangeal joint. The middle and proximal phalanx are separated by the proximal interphalangeal joint, abbreviated PIP. During our examinations, as well as real life, you should always be very, very specific with your labeling. So for example, 
instead of writing the thumb, you should actually write first metacarpal of the right hand. Here's another example. This bone right here that my small white arrow is resting on, we would call this blue blue that my white pointer is resting on. We would call this the middle phalanx of the second right digit. So not only did I name the finger, but I named the specific structure and I told you which hand it was on. So let's look at this, where my white pointer is on. What structure is this? It's the proximal phalanx of the fifth right digit. If I was pointing at this structure, you'd say it's the second metacarpal of the right hand. If you'd like to take a break, now would be a great time because I'm about to transition into the lower limb and the pelvic girdle. Just like the shoulder girdle of our upper body, the pelvic girdle of the lower body consists of two structures, the hip bones. Hip bones are called ilium. When they're plural, it's called iliae. I-L-I-A-E. They're also known as pelvic bones. The pelvic bones unite anteriorly at a joint called the pubic symphysis. And they unite posteriorly with the sacrum to form the sacroiliac joint. The function of the pelvic girdle is to provide support for the vertebral column as well as our lower abdominal organs. Just like the rib cage above protected the organs in our thoracic cavity, the pelvic girdle will protect organs in our lower abdomen and pelvic cavity. Also, the pelvic girdle connects our lower limbs to our axial skeleton in the midline. In a newborn, each of the ilium, each hip bone, is actually in three parts. But by age approximately 23, those three bones will become fused into one. So let's take a look at this diagram. In the center, posteriorly, you have the sacrum bone. The sacrum connects to each ilium, which is this entire structure right here. So the sacrum connects to each ilium via the sacroiliac joint, located at the top of my white mouth. Each ilium connects together in the front via a joint called the pubic symphysis. We're going to look at each of the three sections of an ilium separately. The three sections are the way that they are because of the way they are in development. So even though their bones are fused together now into one piece, one ilium, they, three, they still maintain three separate areas. So the first area that we're going to look at is in the yellow color on your screen. And this is a lateral view. So we're looking at this from lateral to medial. And this large hole right here called the acetabulum, this is where the top of the femur would, would fit in. So your small skeleton in your lower right corner will remind you of what view we're looking at. parts of the ilium is called ilium, yellow shading. Let's start at the left side on the top. These first three lines here, here, and here are called gluteal lines. And from, uh, from S to I, they're posterior anterior and inferior gluteal lines. Then 
On the posterior aspect of this bone, we have two large projections here and here. The more superior being the posterior superior iliac spine, abbreviated PSIS, posterior superior iliac spine. The lower of these two large projections on the posterior aspect is called the posterior inferior iliac spine, abbreviated PIIS. Going more superiorly to that but still staying in the same area is a very large notch. This notch is for the largest nerve in our body, the sciatic nerve, so it's called the greater sciatic notch. Then we have this large circular structure for the femur head to fit into called the acetabulum. And you can see by the coloring in this diagram that the acetabulum is represented in all three parts of the bone. And above the acetabulum, but below those gluteal lines, is the body of the ilium. Coming around the front side of this bone, we have two smaller projections here and here. These are called the anterior superior iliac spine, abbreviated ASIS, and the anterior inferior iliac spine, abbreviated AIIS, respectively. The area superior to that on the anterior aspect is called the ala. We've heard this structure before. We learned it when we learned the sacrum. We also have the iliac crest, which is represented by the three little lines you see to the left of this box, here, here, and here. So the iliac crest is this whole piece wrapping around the top of our hip bone right here. Going back to our medial view instead of a lateral view, we've already identified the stru structures on the top. Let's look at a few on the bottom. We have the ischial spine which is located between the greater and lesser sciatic notch. Here's the medial aspect of that ischial tuberosity, our sit bone. We can see the large obturator foramen. We can also see the articulation for the pubic symphysis. This is where the two hip bones will join anteriorly at the pubic symphysis. The top of our pubic symphysis is called the pubic tubercle. And then we also have pectineal lines of the pubis. When you're looking at a model or a skeleton, it's very easy to identify which is a male and which is a female pelvis. The female pelvis will be shorter in height, it will be wider, and it will be shallower. It will also be thinner and lighter in weight, which is the opposite of what you might think with a wider pelvis, but it's actually thinner and lighter. Also, the pelvic brim is more oval. If you look in the diagrams in your upper right, the female pelvis looks more like an oval right here in this pelvic brim than a smaller tidal circle right here in a male pelvis. And the reason for all of these differences between the two pelvis is for the female pelvis to accommodate for the birthing process. Just like our upper limb, we have 30 bones in the lower limb but this time the 30 are divided into four different locations. We have the thigh, which represents the area between hip and knee. We have the kneecap. We have the leg, 
which represents the area between knee and ankle. And then we have both the ankle and foot. On our lower limb, we have the pelvic girdle bones. We've got the femur bone. We have the patella, which is the kneecap. We have the tibia and fibula, which are in the leg. And then in our foot and ankle, we have tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges. Now, just like our hands, these words sound very similar, but one letter off. The hands are carpals and the feet are tarsals. And both hands and feet do have phalanges. The femur is the longest, strongest, and heaviest bone in our entire body. The proximal end of the femur articulates with the acetabulum of the hip bone, and the distal end articulates with the tibia and the patella. There are a number of structures you'll need to know on a femur. Let's begin at the top. This is a view of the right femur. This is the lateral aspect. And we're looking at it right side up. So we're looking at it S to I and from anterior view. First we have the head of the femur. This looks a lot like the humerus in the arm. Then we have a greater and lesser trochanter, which also looks a lot like the humerus in the arm. Again, we have an anatomical and surgical neck. The anatomical neck being between the head and the trochanters, which is a remnant of the epiphyseal growth plate. And then the surgical neck being inferior to the trochant lesser trochanter, but before the shaft or the body of the femur. Then at the distal end, we're going to have an articular surface, the patellar surface. And just like above, we're going to have a medial condyle, which is this large projection on the medial distal end of the humerus. And we'll have the lateral condyle. The patella bone is also known as our kneecap. This is a triangle shaped bone and it's anterior to our knee joint. The patella is also very interesting because it's the largest sesamoid bone in the body. The patella develops inside of a muscle called the quadriceps femoris. And for that reason, one of the patella's functions is to increase leverage of that muscle. It functions in maintaining the position of the knee when it's bent. And it also protects the knee joint. To note on the patella are the base, apex, and articular facet. So this is a view of our patella. On the left you have the anterior view, and the right is the posterior view. The base is this larger, more rounded edge, and the apex is the more pointed, inferior edge. The patella almost looks like it could be a heart shape to me, and the apex is the bottom of that heart. Then, on the posterior aspect of the patella, we have the articular surface. This is the surface that's going to articulate with those condyles on the distal end of the femur above it. The tibia and fibula are the two bones in the leg. And they're also very similar in some ways to the two bones of the arm, the radius and ulna. One way to remember which is tibia and which is fibula is to say the phrase, the fibula is lateral. And you can see the word LA in both of those. The tibia is also known as our shin bone. 
This is the larger bone of the leg and it's more medial. Since the tibia is the largest and most medial bone, it also bears most of the weight of the leg. And you have four structures to know on the tibia. Medial and lateral condyles, tibial tuberosity, medial malleolus, and fibular notch. The fibula is on the lateral side of the leg. It's smaller and thinner than the tibia. And it actually does not articulate with the femur. The fibula is also the most fractured long bone in the body. And the most common type of fracture that occurs is a compound open fracture. Two important structures to know on the fibula are the head of the fibula and the lateral malleolus. One slide. In between our medial malleolus of the tibia and our lateral malleolus of the fibula, this space right here is where the talus bone of the foot will sit to form the ankle joint called the talocrural joint. Back to my diagram and I look beneath the big toe, the bone I see on that side is the navicular with the cuboid being on the lateral part. So this is navicular. We also have three arches of the foot. We have our medial longitudinal arch. We have the lateral longitudinal arch. And we have the transverse arch. In your both your upper right and lower right diagrams, these are represented by letters and colors. The medial longitudinal arch is on the medial aspect of the foot. It's below the first metatarsus. So on this diagram, A to C is the medial longitudinal arch. A medial longitudinal arch is represented here by the red circle. The lateral longitudinal arch is from B to C on this diagram. And on this diagram, the lateral longitudinal arch is represented by the purple. And then we have the transverse arch, which also goes by the name of metatarsal arch, which describes to its location. The transverse arch in the upper diagram is represented by the line between A to B. And on this diagram, it's called metatarsal arch and is represented by this yellow oval. Now, during the gait cycle, which describes taking a single step, 60% of the weight is on our heel and 40% of our weight is at the bottom of the foot by the metatarsals. You may be surprised that the gait cycle, the ability just to take one step and the mechanics behind that with all of the bones in the foot plus three arches, and it being the foundation for everything above it, such as the ankle joint, the knee joint, the hip joint, the pelvis and the low back, is actually pretty in depth. The gait cycle is pretty amazing if you think about it. And that wraps up this very long lecture on the entire appendicular skeleton. So today we covered shoulder girdle, the upper limb, the pelvic girdle, and the lower limb. And those are the aspects of the appendicular skeleton that we'll be reviewing for these purposes. Of course, there are many more structures on each of these bones that you could learn to label, but this is where we're going to place most of our focus. Again, we are going to be spending next week doing two labs because we did two lectures this week. So the next two days of class, we're going to be spending time answering lab questions, practicing labeling and identifying structures,
doing activities, and so forth. So if you could please bring your lab book to both days next week, that would be great. The week after that, we'll come in on Wednesday to take our exam on the axial and appendicular skeletons. Don't forget about your quiz, and don't forget to check that homework assignment called the health condition paper in your syllabus. I did go through this lecture very quickly, and it is a lot of material. I would definitely suggest that you go through this multiple times, or feel free to rewind and re-listen to things that you need to hear again. And I will look forward to seeing you on next Wednesday. Thank you. Have a great weekend.